Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're going to get started on um, the webinar today. Um, a couple things um, before we get going. So right now we have everybody on, on mute um, so that they're kind of minimize the background noise. Um, if you do have any questions as we proceed, um, you can type in your questions in the, the Q&A box, um, and we will try to answer them as we go. We'll also have time at the end to um, answer any additional questions that you might have as we get started. Um, so today's webinar is, um, oops. Uh, sorry, a little technical difficulty here. <laughs> okay, today's webinar is um, getting started um, as a new Crossref, um, as a new Crossref member. And um, my name is Susan Collins, and I am one of the members of the Crossref Community Outreach Team. Um, today's webinar, um, we hope to give new members tips on getting started with Crossref. Um, and it will include topics such as creating identifiers, registering content, reviewing some of our member obligations, um, as well as how to get assistance and staying in touch. We also help to address some of the most common questions um, and topics that new members often have. So now that you are a member of Crossref, um, you can now get involved with our community, connect your content with the global network of online research, and take up additional infrastructure services. And I know a lot of you have joined Crossref. Um, the, the question we always get is, I want to I get DOIs, I want to assign DOIs to my content. And that's great, um, but being a member of Crossref is more than just about DOIs. Um, as a Crossref member, you're joining a community currently um, over 10,000 members from about 125 different countries. Um, and your organization could be a research institution, a commercial publisher, a government agency, um, perhaps a university library. And our members are not just publishing journals, but a variety of research and scholarly content. And they have very different business models. They could be open access, subscription, pay-per-view, or some combination. And you may have one publication or you have many. But what you all have in common is that you want to share your research outputs through metadata and persistent identifiers. Just a little bit of um, Crossref history to get started. When we began in the year 2000, we had 12 founding members. Um, and our membership was primarily from uh, the United States and Western Europe. However, over the last few years, we've really seen our membership grow uh, both in number and in globally. And because of this, we're seeing a new type of audience with many different needs from where we first began. Um, in the last two years, we've had over 3,500 new members join from all around the world. Um, the largest areas in terms of growth for new members are in the Asia Pacific and Eastern European regions. Uh, with nearly half of our new members coming from these areas. Uh, about one third of these members are not-for-profit organizations, and around half are publishers that register 100 or fewer um, content items with Crossref. And that's a lot of metadata that's being, that's being deposited with us. Um, and who uses Crossref? Crossref isn't just for what we consider a, a publisher per se. Um, we have um, funders and in, in research institutions, um, archives, government organizations, registration agencies, um, publishing vendors. All of these organizations come to Crossref, uh, perhaps they're depositing metadata or they're querying our, our existing database for metadata that our members have deposited. And the number of types of organizations that use Crossref continues to grow each year, especially as we expand the content types and the related metadata that our, our members register with us. And we often get questions from people applying, you know, why should I join Crossref? What are the benefits, you know, to me as a, as a publisher? Um, and though the largest group of our, of our members are publishers or organizations that produce content, 
Um, they do come in sort of all shapes and sizes, but they all benefit from having their content uh, registered with us. Assigning DOIs and registering content helps to get this content, um, helps it, the content to be discovered more easily. Uh, it shows people where, um, where their content is located and can, uh, the location of that content can easily be updated um, if the content should move. Um, registering content, excuse me, does drive more traffic to your publications. Um, and using identifiers allows you to turn your references into hyperlinks. Also, registering your content, assigning DOIs, does allow people to, publishers to find out who is using and citing your content. Um, and Crossref um, members also can participate in a number of other collaborative services that we offer to our members. When your content has been registered with us, we make whatever metadata that you've sent to us um, available um, and we send it out ver by a variety of sources. And there's a number of organizations that use this metadata to, um, to facilitate their operations, like libraries, indexing services, researchers use the metadata to, to find content. Also, um, discovery services um, use the metadata um, for their organizations as well. The links that you, that you use for your identifiers are persistent. Um, the content will live on regardless of where the content moves. Um, and we'll talk a little bit um, later on about um, maintaining your metadata and keeping your URLs up to date. And also, the Crossref community will be able to link to your content. Um, and we're going to discuss, again, in more detail, um, one of the membership requirements is using Crossref identifiers in reference lists so that when content is registered, other members will be able to discover these identifiers and easily uh, link uh, to your content through their sites. And it's also um, important to keep in mind that it's only your metadata that's shared, not your full text. Crossref does not collect any full text of any content. It's only the identifying metadata for that content that members give to us. Um, so let's begin. We're gonna talk first um, about sort of how you get started. Um, by now you've, you've completed the, the application process. Your new Crossref account is active. And um, so where do you begin? And that's a, a lot of times new members are a little bit unsure as to how to get started. Let's take a first look at some of the information that's been sent to you. You would have received from us um, a welcome email, and that email does contain a lot of information. So if you look at the first section of the email that was sent to us, uh, that was sent to you, um, there's a section on getting started with content registration. This section contains the prefix and the login um, for your specific account, as well as um, the different the different links that you can use to access the content registration areas. Let's talk first about your prefix. Um, you've been assigned a unique prefix uh, for your account, and that is in the format of the number 10 followed by five numbers. Um, you may see in the literature older prefixes that have 10 and four numbers. Um, when, when, pre when DOIs were first used, um, that was that was the format, and in about 2012, it went to the 10 five-digit format. So you, you'll, you're going to see both in the literature. With a prefix, um, one prefix may be used for all content that you publish. Some members have one publication, some have multiple publications. Um, so even if the content types you you publish are, are different. You might publish books and journals, for example. You can use that one prefix to register all of your content. Now, should you add new titles um, to your account as you go, as you continue on, you don't have to, to notify us prior to registering content for that new title. Um, your prefix, your account covers all content um, that you produce. And each member, has a unique publishing schedule. Some members publish weekly, some monthly, um, some might just be once or twice per year. So DOIs can be registered at 
any time. There's no limit to the number of DOIs that you can create, and there's no minimum number of DOIs that are required for your account. So let's take a look at a DOI in a little bit more detail. One of the, one of the questions that we sometimes get from members is um, they, they misunderstand sometimes that they think that, that Crossref is going to actually send them the DOIs that they need, uh, that they request DOIs as they're needed. And, and that's not, um, that's not what's, what's, what happens with your account. You use the prefix to create the DOI to create the identifier for each piece of content. So looking at, at the structure of the identifier that you're going to be using, um, the a DOI is, is composed of three sections. The, the red part, the doi.org that you see, um, is the resolver address. And it's important to keep in mind that a, that a DOI, it's an identifier, but it's also a link. And this first part, Makes, um, makes the DOI an actionable link and it becomes resolvable in a browser. The second part of, of the DOI is the prefix, which is the part that Crossref gives to you with your account. And the yellow is the suffix. And this is the part of the DOI that is created by the publisher and it's going to be unique for each content item that's registered. And we get a lot of questions from new members, a little bit unsure as to how to create um, the suffix for each DOI. It's important to keep in mind that a DOI is an opaque identifier, meaning the DOI itself doesn't necessarily have any meaning, and there isn't a prescribed formula that you really need to follow. But what you do need to know, and our best advice for this, is that DOI suffixes should be consistent, short, and simple. And they should be consistent for your sake, establishing um, a pattern or suffix generation process that's easy to maintain. And they should be simple for the same reason. Um, you want them to be short so that they don't take up um, endless amounts of space when used in your publications or in citations. And again, a DOI suffix doesn't need to state anything about the item that it's identifying. That's all done with the metadata that you register with us. The characters that you can use to create the suffix, um, you can use any letters A through Z or number zero through nine and certain other characters such as hyphens or parentheses. Now some members may choose to use the ISSN um, for their suffix or perhaps a combination of the volume and the issue, perhaps the title abbreviation. These are some examples on the screen here. You can see of different um, identifiers that have been registered with us and different examples of suffixes. Um, on some of our slides, you'll see here um, links. And when the, the slides are going to be available later for you to view, these links, this particular one, will bring you to our support documentation on creating identifiers. And it goes into a little bit more depth about some of the guidelines that we have for creating um, suffix generation. So now that you've created your identifiers, we do have certain guidelines uh, for their usage. DOI should always be displayed as a full URL link. Um, best exa an example of this here is in the format um, that you see on the screen. You may see older formats um, with the HTTP dx.doi.org. We updated our, um, our guidelines um, back in last year in 2017 and got rid of the DX and added the um, HTTPS for the, the secure protocol. The existing DOIs that were in the older format will continue to resolve properly. Um, it's important that we, that we have, have the, the display guidelines. Um, it's important for consistency and usability that all members follow the guidelines. Um, so when displaying them on your, on your website, it's, it's important to keep them in the format that, is, um, that you see here. 
And once you have um, registered your content with us, users are going to be able to retrieve your identifiers and create links with them. Again, your Crossref identifiers should either resolve to either the full text of the content or to a landing page that you maintain. Um, and your landing page must have the following information. Um, a full bibliographic citation. Um, this enables the user to, to verify that they've been delivered to the article that they were searching for. Um, the DOI, again, displayed as the URL per the display guidelines. And a way to access the full text. Um, now, again, DOIs and identifiers don't change any access model that publishers have. If, if it is required that a reader pay or log in to access the content, the DOI doesn't change that. So the DOI can go either to the full text or to a landing page. The landing page must be accessible to everyone. But that landing page would, would tell the reader how they could access the content, whether they had to log in or whether they had to pay um, or some other control that, that the publisher has. This is an example of a landing page. And you can see the DOI is displayed um, in the full text um, right next to uh, the journal name. It also has um, the uh, information that it's not accessible and it, that they are logging into their account would give the member access or the reader access. Um, and it also gives the full bibliographic information, the name of the journal article, the authors, um, the title of the journal, et cetera. So we talked a bit about journals here, but um, the journal articles, journal content is our, log our largest type of content that members register with us. Um, it's not, CrossFit isn't just for journals. Um, you can also register um, book and book chapters, conference proceedings, pen papers, uh, reports and working papers, dissertations, standards, uh, preprints, uh, data sets and components, which would be some supplemental materials to, to content, such as charts or graphs, um, et cetera. Now, each of these content types that's registered with us, the metadata for each of these uh, does vary. When you register content with us, you have to send us the basic citation metadata for each item that's registered. And this would include such items like the title, authors, publication dates, um, issue numbers, ISSN or ISBN numbers, um, anything that describes the content that you're registering. And we have minimal requirements as we need to support uh, a large range of publication practices. Um, but we do ask you that you send us as much metadata as possible and that it be accurate and clean. The more robust your metadata is, the more likely that your identifiers will be discovered and disseminated. We also collect um, a large number of non-bibliographic metadata about the items being registered. And these can be just as useful as the bibliographic metadata. Um, items such as reference lists, so that members can see uh, which other members are citing their content. Funding data to connect research outputs to funding. Um, ORCIDs, so that your authors are easily identified. Text and data mining license data, clinical trial information. And then um, with our Crossmark service, information about errata, retractions, updates, um, and, and more. And we're always looking into what else there is to collect that may be of use to our community. Going into a bit more detail now about actually registering your content. So everything that comes into our system ultimately comes, is, is sent in in XML. Um, and so the basics are, are fairly simple. Um, you create Crossref, Crossref XML either through systems on your end or using tools on our end. So the XML comes into us, we process it, and you or your systems verify that your content has been registered. So there's, there's two ways that this, this, two of the ways this can be done um, are uh, through uploading an XML file 
um, through our site at doi.crossref.org or by manually entering each piece of metadata into our web deposit form on our website. And links to both of these um, are, did appear in the welcome email that was sent to you. So if you're going to, to generate your own XML and deposit it through our system, um, Crossroads has its own metadata schema for deposits. And the schema is just a set of rules defining uh, defining what can and can't or what can be included in the format that it needs to be in. Um, and the metadata schema are used for all deposits for all metadata with Crossref. And here there are links here and, and these will be available as well for those who want to have a look at the format that um, that your XML must be in when submitting um, your own XML file to Crossref. Um, a large number of our members, though, aren't, aren't able to generate their own Crossref Ready XML, so we do have an alternative available. We have a manual entry form, which we call the Web Deposit Form. Um, it's very basic. You enter in your metadata field by field, um, and in the background, the form will write and submit the XML for processing. Now, you can use this form for journal um, article content as well as books conference proceedings, um, some reports, and some supplemental metadata deposits. Um, and you don't need to know XML to use this form. Um, and I'm just gonna mention briefly, um, we are gonna soon be rolling out um, a new improved deposit tool, which um, will be coming out soon. Um, and this is called the Metadata Manager. It's currently being tested with a small number of members, but we're going to be opening it up more broadly um, very soon. The first release of this tool um, is just going to be for journal articles, but um, over time we'll be entering the additional content types for it. Um, and we'll keep both the web deposit form um, available as well um, for members who do have other content types. And you'll see more about this, um, more about this form um, as we get closer to, to launching it. Um, so when your file has been uploaded, either through um, sending in a, an XML file or using the web deposit form, um, the information is added to our submission queue using, and you'll receive a notification that it has been received. Um, and this notification goes to the email address of the person, um, the email address that was included with the deposit. Um, most files are processed within just a few minutes, um, but sometimes if traffic is high, it, it can take a little bit longer for your, your deposit to go through um, the submission queue. You'll get back an email that says that the submission has been, the deposit's been received. Um, and in that email, you'll get a message whether it was deposited successfully or if it failed. Just getting the email isn't verification that your deposit was successful. So you have to take a look at the log and make sure that you got um, the success um, notification at the bottom of the email. So if your deposit is processed successfully, you're done, your metadata record is in the database and you can start putting the DOI um, on your content and using it to link if the deposit fails, you'll receive an information as to why it failed, and then you will have to go back and resubmit the metadata with the, with that, uh, the, with the correction made. So it's really important after you've registered your content that you don't ignore it. Um, it's metadata maintenance um, is very important to keeping your links, um, your links active. Sometimes though things do change or you realize that an error has been made in the deposit. There's a number of situations that can arise after you've registered your DOIs and all of these are situations where DOI and metadata maintenance is key. For example, you may have noticed that an author's name was entered incorrectly or another piece of, of metadata was not um, deposited correctly at the time or your publication moves from one website to another or one hosting provider to another and you need to update the URL. 
It's important in any of these scenarios that you don't reassign another DOI to it um, and that the existing DOI is maintained. It's just the metadata that's updated. And there's never a charge to update um, any, any metadata, any DOI. You can update it as many times as needed. So there's different, depending on what needs to be updated, the process for, for each differs a little bit. For example, um, if you notice that there's an error or need to update any of the bibliographic metadata, the, it's required that you resubmit all of the bibliographic metadata as a whole. You can't just resubmit the one item, um, but you, you would re make the deposit again with the correction made to the metadata. If you're only changing the URL, there's a different process. What you would do is send to us um, a CSV file of the DOI in the new URL. You can send that to our technical staff at support uh, at crossref.org, and they would make the changes for you in your, in your metadata. It takes about 24 hours um, or so uh, for the changes to, to be updated once we receive that information. So next up, you've registered your content, it's successful, you've put your DOIs on your page, on your landing page, etc. The next step is one of our uh, membership obligations, and this is called reference linking. And what this means is that you are including cross of DOIs in your reference lists. This allows a reader to be able to click on the DOI and be, taking, be, be taken to the article or the landing page of the article that you've cited. And um, this is an obligation only for journal content and only for content that you have registered with Crossref after joining Crossref. So if you went back, say, and, and assigned DOIs to your legacy content, um, Though we would encourage you to add reference links to that, it is not a requirement. It's only for new content, new journal content after you've started. Um, now, we realize that not all of your citations are going to have a DOI. Some might have a DOI from another registration agency, or they may not have any at all. And so if there's no cross of DOI registered, there's no obligation to add any type of link. A couple of examples of reference linking. You can see here in the first example, the um, citation uses the cross FDOI in the standard um, format of a hyperlink. You may also, um, in the second example, um, the DOI is displayed as a hyperlink. The, the word cross F is hyperlinked to the DOI that will, will take you to that text. So either of these is acceptable for, um, for use in reference linking. So the easiest way to check to see if your citation reference list has DOIs is using our simple text query form. Um, and this is available on our website. What you would do, you can see here, um, you would enter the registered email for the, for the person using the form, paste the references into the text box in the middle, and hit submit. Um, you, you would, if, if a DOI, if a cross of DOI exists for that citation, then it would appear in the results. Now, if a DOI is, is not, does not appear in the results, um, it may be that the publisher of that of that article is not a Crossref member or may not have registered that particular item with us yet. Um, it's also an opportunity to check to make sure that the reference is accurate. Um, if it's incomplete, it may be that our system can't find um, that there's a DOI for it. And again, it may be that um, another registration agency was used to register a content item and that DOI would not be available in the Crossref system. So we talked a bit about registering content and the importance of metadata, um, but being a member with us is more than just registering, registering your content. 
we encourage CrossFit is a membership organization, and we encourage all members, uh, big and small, to become more involved with CrossRef, um, especially our board elections. We have a 16-member board um, that's taken from our membership, um, and it is a, a, a rather diverse group. It's both not-for-profit and commercial publishers, um, large, small, and very globally diverse. And each one of our members gets one vote in our, our board elections. So whether you have, um, you're a small publisher with one journal or a large commercial publisher with hundreds of journals, you, each member has just one vote. Our board elections are held um, each November at our annual member meeting. We send out voting information um, around September of each year to our members. We also have a number of advisory and working groups, and we encourage all of our members to become involved with those. Um, we have groups on different CrossRef services, as well as specific interests, such as book publishing or standards publishing. And when new services are in development, we often organize a new group um, to help with that, ser that service being developed. Um, and we're actively looking for more participants um, for our groups and committees. And we have a, on our website, you'll see there the link, um, take a look at what the different groups are. And if there are any that interest you, you can let us know um, and we can reach out to you with more information. Another um, topic that new members um, often email us about is invoicing. And so when you all joined, you paid a membership fee. Most likely that fee was prorated um, for the first year, um, depending on the month in which you joined us. So all of our accounts renew each January 1st. Um, we send out the annual member invoices about mid-December um, of each year. Now the deposits for your content items that are registered we don't require you to prepay your deposits. We invoice those quarterly in January, April, July, and October. Um, and each of those invoices is for the deposits made in the previous three months. And for invoices, we do accept credit cards, uh, bank wire transfers, PayPal, check. Um, those are all options for our members. And if you have any questions at all about any invoicing, or bills, you can contact our finance team, um, billing at crossref.org. Now I know we, we kind of touched on um, just some of the basics here in this, in this webinar, but we do have um, a number of pre-recorded webinars on our site that go into um, each of these topics in more in-depth, um, with more in-depth information, content registration, maintaining your metadata, querying metadata, and there are webinars for each of our services. Um, there's also, you'll find a list um, on our website of upcoming webinars that you may be interested in joining as well. Um, our support center at support.crossref.org has uh, comprehensive technical documentation that is uh, grouped by uh, registering content, maintaining your metadata, and retrieving and querying metadata. Oops. Sorry. Okay, and also, um, as well as the help documentation on that site, um, our technical support team at support at crossref.org um, can answer any questions that you may have regarding your um, your deposits or how to query, if you have questions on any of the identifiers that you may have registered with us. Again, our webinars are available. Um, and our member team, member experience team, is also available at member at crossf.org um, with any questions you have about your account or if you're not sure where to direct a question, you can always um, ask our membership team and they can um, direct you accordingly. We also have two Twitter feeds, uh, CrossRef.org and CrossRef Support, that um, you're welcome to follow. And both of these will give updates on such things as webinars or other events that CrossRef might be hosting. Our CrossRef Support Twitter also will give updates if any of our services um, or systems have any issues or any downtime for maintenance, et cetera. We have a blog 
that um, a number of our um, of our staff contribute to, as well as um, external guest authors, um, covering a number of topics. Some are very technical. Um, some are uh, cover a lot of the basics or topics um, for the publishing field in general. Um, and for those of you that are so inclined, we have our lab section of our website that covers um, sort of new and experimental tools and initiatives that our research and development team are working on. So there's a number of ways to stay in touch with us and also to contact us if there's ever any questions about any aspect of your membership. And that kind of wraps up the, this portion of it, but we are happy to, to answer any questions. I know my colleagues have been answering them throughout the webinar. Um, so we are happy to, um, to kind of take any more questions that you may have. Um, and we'll take the, we'll take the questions um, in the question and answer um, text, text box that you have um, on the webinar. Um, there's a question here about reference linking. Um, you don't have to put the reference links uh, if, you, if you have a print copy of the journal. It would just need to go on um, the digital copy, um, the online version of your, of your journal, not in the print, in the print version. Um, there was a question too about OJS. There is a plugin that OJS has that will feed the metadata to Crossref to register content. Um, it is, um, it, though it's, it's not a system that Crossref runs itself, but it is, it's, it's uh, PKP is, are the, um, who runs, who runs the, the service. Um, so we are we are familiar with it, but it is the, the documentation for using the service is available on the uh, on the PKP site itself, and they have a um, a user guide available there. Um, just a, a follow up on the um, the OJS. We it, it is a system that that Crossref worked in conjunction with PKP to build. Um, the majority of the support for it um, does go through OJS. So if you had questions specifically about about your um, your OJS system, um, we can't Crossref can't see that specifically. Um, we can see the metadata that comes in, the deposits that come in. So we can always check that for you. But the actual, um, the actual, inf your website itself is not something that Crossref would be able to see.
So right now we're just answering a few questions online for people who um, have pending questions. Um, if you don't have any questions, um, you are, you're free to stay or you're free to, um, to go. We will make the slides available um, for the, um, on our website. So if you wanted to rewatch it um, at any point or access any of the links, um, you may do so. And again, if you have any questions, please um, uh, give us an email, support at Crossref or member at crossref.org, um, and we're happy to help you out.
Awesome. Okay, everyone, we're going to um, end for today. If there's any further questions that you have, please send us an email and we will follow up with you um, individually. Thank you all again for attending and we hope to see you on another webinar sometime soon.